morning all and uh, uh, this is the fourth uh, in this solidarity series webinars uh, that we have started on 31st of march uh, these are the conversations during lockdown and beyond uh, the title of today's webinar um, is uh, what needs to be done to strengthen the public health system in india and uh this is essentially in the context of the uh, covid-19 pandemic that we are seeing uh across the globe and the 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 pressure on the health systems that's being created because of this uh, uh disease and the pandemic uh the speaker for today's seminar uh, webinar is uh, dr t sundaraman uh uh before we start i'll just briefly uh, introduce to dr sundaraman uh dr sundaraman is a uh, public health expert he's former executive director of the national health systems resource center uh he is also former dean of school of health system studies at the tata institute of social sciences uh he was he is former uh, director of state health resource center in chatisgarh uh, uh dr sundaraman has been very actively involved in health and education movements in india uh, primarily with the jan swasthya abhiyan uh the people's health movement in india and also all india people's science network uh he is a founding man, member of uh, aipsm that is the all india people science network and has been part of uh, the jan swasth abhiyan since its formation uh he has played a leading role in organizing the first national health assembly and creating the jsa uh currently he is the global coordinator of public health movement uh, this is a global network of grassroots health activists civil society organizations uh and academic institutions around the world with presence in 70 countries uh, he has written several books on health issues and a number of articles uh, that have been published in uh, peer reviewed uh, journals uh before i formally uh, hand it over to dr sundaraman for his talk uh, uh just a few points to keep the session in order um uh, uh we request the speaker to have uh, around 20 20 minutes plus minus uh, for the talk and then we can move on to question answer and discussions uh, with the participants uh i request all the participants to keep their microphones on mute when they are not speaking uh this session is uh, being recorded uh and we will share the links on youtube youtube and uh, the cfa website that senfa.org um zoom the software that we are using for this online uh, uh webinar has a uh, raise hand button if you want to ask questions please uh, press that button and we'll uh, ask you to uh, uh, request you to ask a question uh alternatively you can also use the chat box uh, for writing in your questions and then we'll 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 uh, ask the speaker to to respond to that um <clears throat> i think uh, uh these are the some of the points that uh, uh please keep this in mind to keep the session uh, uh, running smoothly uh with this i hand it, hand this over to dr sundaraman for 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 the talk thank you dr sundaram yeah thank you for this invitation uh i will uh, try to be brief 20 minutes is uh, relatively brief for a very extensive topic uh i think there is a lot of renewed interest in strengthening public health services and as they say the best time to start strengthening public health services is 10 to 15 years back if we had done that we we would be much better ready now well having missed that the next best time to start is now so i think it's a good thing that we actually discuss the basics of health systems preparedness now because you can see that however extensive the private sector 
when it comes to the actual response to the epidemic, even those who are willing are very few. And across the place, many of the private sector units have actually closed down, being uh, rather uh, take the risk or uh, do not have the capacity to cope with this. And therefore, in times of crisis, it is the public health service we need. And to have that in place when we need it, we need to have it there all the time. We say in disaster management that if your system cannot cope with one house collapse or one burns injury, how will what will it do when there is an earthquake? So similarly, the health of your system under routine times is the best way to be ensured that you are able to take care of an epidemic. Now, broadly, we can say that strengthening health systems has some eight or nine essential components. And I will run you through these and then we can see why at some point, what, are, what else has been done and how we must think about it. The first, of course, is investment. And whichever way you go about it, whatever the exact way, we know from international cross-country studies, we know from our own experience cross states, that unless there is a minimum proportion of public health expenditure, you are not going to be able to strengthen healthcare systems. People, there are nations with very good efficiency that has managed it at three to 4% of their GDP. There are other nations that have needed nine to 10% of their GDP. But at some point, about 5%, three to 5% of the GDP seems to be an absolute minimum, which works out to several lakh crores. And even if we say that the state government is spending 67% of it or 70% of it, it still means a much larger budget. So when the prime minister announced 15,000 crores for the health response to the COVID-19 epidemic, that was really welcome. But one could not help wishing that this had been the incremental increase in budget since 2016. Then we would have been near to fulfilling what we had promised under this own government's national health policy. I'm not talking of just 15,000 crores a year. So in 2016, when the budget came out, I wrote an article in the Economic and Political Weekly, which actually spelled out that at this rate, the public health situation is so threatened that if an epidemic comes along, it's the health of everyone, including the rich, which will be at threat. And it will not only be the health sector, but also the, uh, the whole economy that would be smashed by such an economics. So in some sense, you needed to have prepared in terms of investment. The other big problem with our healthcare system, public health system, is a problem of design. The system is designed to be minimalist, to give a minimal package of services to the least amount of possible people and leave the rest to the private sector. This is not something that happens by default because the public sector doesn't work well. This is the design. So we say we will give reproductive and child health services, TB, HIV, leprosy, some uh, services that have a lot of externality, but the rest we leave to markets, which in effect means that your whole district healthcare system takes care of less than 15% of healthcare needs of a population. So when people say the healthcare system has poor quality, yes, there are many dimensions of poor quality, behavior, timeliness, cleanliness, sanitation, but the heart of it is that you do not get care that is appropriate to your need. You go with the hypertension or diabetes and you can get only a vitamin pill or a paracetamol. It's not going to really help at all. And most of non-communicable diseases are not even within the ambit of care in this design of very selective health care. So the first and foremost things that we need to do in strengthening public health systems beyond the question of investment is to expand the range of services 
to cover a critical uh, to come to be comprehensive why are we running for icu beds why are we running now for ventilators if every district had a norm of one icu bed per 30000 population a corresponding number of patient transport vehicles a corresponding number of ventilators then yes we would have needed some more which we could have brought in where the epidemic is speaking from other places but or built up a bit on manufacture but the fact is we have actually not invested in building investive care intensive care units at the district hospitals and even at many of the medical college hospitals and when the muzaffarpur uh, poisoning of children happened when at gorakhpur you had a lot of encephalitis cases many of those children died because of lack of oxygen and uh, respiratory distress or uh, coma of different sorts and what was happening in gorakhpur people from 50 million hinterland were coming to one medical college hospital whereas you needed one such facility for every 1 million population so you needed 50 such facilities and it was being concentrated in gorakhpur and the team at gorakhpur got uh, castigated and everybody accused it but there was actually such a intensive care has to be necessarily uh, much widely available and that is what i mean by saying we were far too selective in care the second thing is and this is a paradox the poorer states particularly did not have adequate policy of free care i mean maybe the outpatient registration charges were low but all diagnostics were charged and most drugs were prescribed to be bought outside or given for very few days so that most times it had to be brought outside therefore the financial protection effect of the public health services was not realized and you could have fairly high less than the private sector but fairly high cost which means a good proportion of the population did not make use of the services at all and one has to start looking at public services as a form of insurance provision and not say should we have public provisioning or insurance provision insurance it is insurance because when we pay our tax direct or indirect and in india indirect taxes are the bulk of it those taxes are used to deliver services when you need them so therefore one is always in all developed civilized nations the notion of public services is a form of tax based insurance provision and in some sense people should understand that this is not really free care this is care at which you are entitled to as part of citizenship or that and that is something very important to understand and we where we needed to have strengthen now there is the other big problem in uh, public health services has been the workforce issues somewhere in the 90s this whole logic of structural adjustment and keeping workforce small keeping government small led to a great reduction of nurses and doctors that are employed in fact between 1993 and 2005 there were no nurses or doctors recruited in many states even to fill up vacancies that occurred due to deaths and people retiring and leaving even there so there was a huge deficit medical education was allowed into the private sector in this period and there was no further investment in medical colleges in that period so the market grew but it grew in the southern and western states and much more with an eye on export and not for public services where they are needed most so it's not that we don't have enough numbers but the number we have a very very uneven distribution with a very great skew so we have excess doctors and nurses in some places and we have a great scarcity in others and you are not going to find doctors from bangalore going to bihar and chatisgarh but you would find people from here going to bihar and even london from chatisgarh and to bangalore or delhi and then even london 
so one had to break it one had to actually distribute where you recruit people for education and train them upwards on that in some sense therefore locality based medical institutions with locality based candidates was necessary across the place quality of care was another issue but we have now a national quality accreditation scheme you needed corruption is another issue but corruption occurs because of very precise accountability failures in procurement in transfers in appointments and in contracting and these can be set right and there are state governments that have got it very right professionalization of management especially diversifying management skills so that you have people like logistics uh, over there the development of public health cadre is another major issue and finally community engagement is uh, and in some sense the various ways in which you decentralize and allow for local self governments and communities to participate in decision making and in management not only as beneficiaries is yet another component so in brief these are the set of measures we can look at other details like digital uh, digitization etc but without these basic uh, structures in place you are going to really have problems on that but before i i close i want to sort of see is aren't these obvious why didn't it happen part of the reason is in investment but that's not part the main reason even it's not the full reason and it's not even the main reason the main reason why many of these basic issues did not occur is because our whole health sector strengthening and reform policy had been influenced by a certain ideological stream called new public management which is an off uh, port of the whole of uh, neoliberal economics on that so here the understanding is that what's wrong with the public services is that markets don't work and therefore all of the effort at reform is to make markets work for health so one was to privatize say public sector is inherently inefficient and try to bring private ownership didn't work another was something called p for p pay for performance and say okay people are getting the same salaries so there is a difference thing and somewhere people who perform more are should be paid more we do requires financing that is responsive to changing requirements but p for p has never worked in fact they always land up where as perverse incentives the trick in healthcare financing is to actually ring fence the doctor's decision making from the monetary incentive so that whether he decides on a cesarean section or normal delivery whether as a hospital i divide, decide to focus on ivf or on cancers all of these are not decided by my profit motive but are defined by my needs and at some point therefore market systems fail to work on that competition and choice does not even lead to better quality such is the nature of information asymmetry on that so eventually these market based solutions displaced very concrete innovative ways in which we could have strengthened public health services and therefore we come to this situation where we have a crisis on our hands so broadly i i think it would be better to go on with questions on that but broadly these are the various reasons at which why we are still one of the weakest public health services i didn't want to spend too much time in pointing out the weaknesses but it should not be underestimated this notion that people vote by their feet and don't uh, therefore go to public services is just so not true wherever you have comprehensive services whether it is an institute like jipmer or safdarjang hospital in delhi or madras medical college or a district hospital in up which has a reasonable range of services they are overcrowded there are people spilling over we have 100 beds and 150 inpatient so it is the lack of services that has actually been the constraint and the moment you have services actually people come but 
to some extent i would say public services have been artificially constrained and limited so as to allow private sector to grow it didn't happen by default it happened as part of the plan and that's part of the problem we are facing now thank you i think we already have a bunch of questions here uh, uh vidya m had uh, raised uh, earlier of what is the government doing um this it's there are it, should i pick up uh, to indicate to me which question you like me to start with yes uh, vidya had early on asked what is the government doing to involve persons keen on helping uh when you had mentioned that health systems require to build capacity for the 15 for the next 15 years uh there are two things one is in the context of the pandemic uh really surprisingly very little you can take on in fact many of the private sector is more at keeping themselves safe and if they come across a patient likely to be covid 19 they have to refer it to a designated center that's the protocol but to the extent they can isolate and send the patient over it would be very good but this is the issue very very few private hospitals have a dedicated icu ward or bed for covid 19 patients but one phenomena is happening that at some places uh, private sector hospitals are being placed under public authority whole lock stock and barrel so that they are converted into covid 19 specialties and very often with the cooperation of the private sector with the private sector hospital actually saying okay we allow you to take this over we can see that in kerala we can see that in chatisgarh and we are likely to see that in more places but when we are not in a pandemic the approach has largely been to have them as a referral center this which has worked if you look at where it has worked very well there are lots of public private partnerships that don't work but if you use them for a critical gap like for example cardiac surgery is available in a private sector hospital in your city or your state but it is not available in the uh, in the public uh, sector so then the person goes to the cardiologist in the public sector gets referred through him for the surgery the surgery gets done at the private sector hospital and the hospital gets reimbursed those sort of gap filling sort of partnerships are the ones that tend to work best otherwise in the private sector the large role of the government has been to have a certain degree of uh, regulation so that it is space within a certain degree of boundaries and perhaps they should encourage much more information sharing allow the management of patient rights those are the sort of limited roles that government plays large scale public private partnerships on a regular basis have not done very well even on the insurance platform though not for profit organizations some of them have done well on insurance uh and uh Dr. Sunita and Roshni Koshi had raised their hands. So, Roshni Koshi, can you unmute and ask your question? Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hi, I just wanted to introduce myself. Uh, I'm a physician who was passed out from CMC Vellore in 2013, uh, doing my MD in general medicine. Then I worked in Jharkhand for a year. and for the past 5 years i've been working in rural karimganj assam in a charitable mission hospital so i was just listening to uh, all the points that you mentioned and uh, like you said it is so obvious but just a few things that i have observed over the years that really distresses me because someone was asking how can we help um, so one of the things that i have found to be like a, a probably a very foundational reason why things are not working out is because the poor are not empowered um if you see these problems happening in a city it gets sorted out because people have the power to ask for their basic rights while for the poor man he doesn't even know that it is a basic right for him and there is no one to act 
on his behalf. Um, so I've been working with poor communities now for the past six years, and I can vouch for the fact that when the poor face problems without advocacy, um, things are not going to change. So for people who are not doctors, you have a huge role to play uh, to bringing forth the challenges of the poor man. In fact, when this whole uh, pandemic happened, the, the sight of migrant workers crossing, it just reminded me of what is happening in healthcare. No one has thought of their grievances. No one has planned it out as you would have planned out for other areas. So that is one thing. And the second thing is, I feel that there's, uh, you said that one of the things that you could do is probably expand uh, health services. But when I actually, over the past years, I've read, about, read through all the government programs that are in place, they are splendid. They're absolutely beautiful. How do you address malnutrition? All the documents, government policies, brilliant. But it's implementation, it's monitoring, it's evaluation, pathetic. So I wouldn't suggest, like, if I had, the, if I had a choice to start off something new, I would just make sure that the systems that are there on paper is put into practice. And I think that itself will um, change the whole situation around. So I just wanted to actually leave those two points um, just as a comment. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Roshini. And that was a very important point too. And I'd ask Dr. Sunita Reddy to ask a question. You had also keyed in your question earlier. So uh, kindly do that. And I would just request all those who are asking questions to keep it brief because we are getting a lot of questions and we have a paucity of time. So kindly keep it brief. Dr. Sunita Reddy. Thank you so much. Uh, very nice to hear you, Dr. Sundaraman. Uh, since I've been working on... <laughs> both uh, disaster and public health, I see hardly there's any convergence. And uh, any disease or epidemics, uh, health, health ministry take over, but then there's hardly any discussion with the DM. Now, with the COVID and a pandemic, we can see how there's so many gaps which are coming up. And in fact, there has to be a kind of business contingency plan ahead so that we, whatever we are seeing, the fallouts can be taken care. And also uh, the DM plan that there are professionals, there are authorities, but all the suggestions have to go in uh, place right in time so that we are better prepared. Uh, I would like to ask, how do we see this convergence between the dis disaster management professionals, doctors and public health professionals? Uh -huh. Yeah, I have, I have uh, the the first question was basically, I mean, I think it was, is it an implementation problem? You know, is it uh, implemented? Government has beautiful documents, but it has a number of uh, schemes, but they are just not there in the field. And uh, I think the uh, second question was really, again, somewhere on that same thing, that we have a lot of capacities, but they are fragmented. You have doctors, public health professionals, and disaster professionals, how do we actually bring them together? I'm going to sort of try to answer this using two other questions. Bala Subramaniam has asked to name one state where uh, these things are happening. Okay, so that we have some visual image of how it can be made to happen. And I think Franco has asked something more specific about Kerala among the chat questions. So can we look at why is it that these states some states like Kerala, certainly, Tamil Nadu, maybe to some extent, Himachal, do somewhat better in some of these areas. Now, one of the things which the Kerala has had for the last three years is something called the Ardram program, Ardram program or something, which means, I think, something like compassion. And what they have been doing with that is to actually improve the quality of public hospitals, get it accredited under national quality accreditation scheme, get the flow on place and expand the range of services provided. Now, we see a lot of good government uh, program documents, but on scale and on implementation on the ground, they are neither financed nor does the human resource allocated, allocated match that. Right. You do not actually have the matching on that. So these documents remain documents. 
unless along with a scheme, the appropriate human resources and financial resources are allocated. They don't go to scale. And one must therefore differentiate schemes which are by intention universal, like say TB program. You are out to catch a TB suspect, whether or not he comes to you, you are going to follow him up, whether or not he comes to you. But with a diabetes program, it is a program which you have declared, but you really don't try to ensure coverage for all, except if you are in some states where they do. So the intent to be universal, the intent to go on scale, the intent to, to match human resources with that. The, and in Kerala, one of the big strengths has been involvement of the local self-governments in the primary care level to ensure that many of these things are translated into practice. Some of the funding is through them. So at some point you have a whole system. It is not really monitoring. It is more a system of facilitation to ensure that that entire range of services that are there is delivered on that. And I think that's the important point. Where it comes to this professional integration, somewhere what you require is a strong district team where different people are able to coordinate, where you create multi-stakeholder teams, whether in the nature of advisory bodies or district committees. So the nature of the district health societies was meant to be that. And it was so in the beginning. But over time, it got routinized, bureaucratized, the spirit of civil society participation, slowly the civil society partners were excluded, slowly the multi-stakeholder professionals were excluded. And now what you have is just a set of government uh, technical bureaucrats who are sitting there, there's officers over there, and it loses all purpose of being a health society. So I think decentralization, with participatory management structures is one way to actually uh, go. And that, I think, is the big learning that we should have from the better performing streams. Okay. Uh, Shivika Agarwal had asked about your views on alternative medicines. Uh, and before you answer, I would request you also to keep it brief because you're getting a lot of questions. So, yeah, Shivika, Shivika Agarwal's question on your views on alternative medicines. Uh, listen, um, it's, a very, uh, it's not my area of strength. I don't deal much in alternative medicines. My job, broad principle on alternative medicines has been that if people have a choice to exercise in this, they must have the space to exercise that choice. We can't proscribe it on the basis of that. But and in the name of alternative medicines that we are providing, alternative medicines, let's not uh, fail to provide some of the medicines that as from modern medicine, which is part of our entitlements. So if alternative medicine is access for that needs to be encouraged, we need to actually study these much more. But I have been uh, engaged all my life with basically the major problematic of ensuring that access to scientifically proven healthcare needs is a, is a basic human right and delivering of that is our one of our constitutional obligations. And uh, Janisha had asked you to elaborate a little more on the role of local self-government in public health systems. So, Actually, we have very few good examples in this. We have very few good examples in this. But we do know that where they work, they work very well. So one of the uh, areas has been, uh, for example, the local self-governments have helped in improving the quality of public facilities. Which may mean everything from building the aesthetics of the surrounding it, cleaning it up, putting a playground there or putting some neat chairs there, improving the ambience inside the hospital, building amenities for the doctors, building uh, amenities for the patients. This is one set. But it is also means that you are putting in a lot of uh, concern to see that certain outreach programs are facilitated. So in the Kerala example, the panchayats are funded to employ a nurse and outreach workers 
who go to the houses of those patients who are elderly or bedridden or on uh, renal dialysis or on cancer chemotherapy to ensure that basic healthcare needs are met and they feel supported on that, acting as outreach. They call that the palliative care program. Now, the entire staffing is through that. And therefore, these are not people who come to the facility. These are people who cannot come to the facility. And when they need to be brought to the facility, there is a transport arranged. But at other times, the outreach is taken care of by the panchayat on that. And this is going to help greatly during COVID-19 when people are at home quarantine and you need to reach people at the home. What you have been doing to reach the elderly and the disabled at home is now going to come useful to reach the non-disabled, but the quarantine. And therefore, they are able to get their home quarantine act together much better than others and reach it out with much less stigmatization of that time. One of the things. Yeah. Shakti John uh, one asked about the PPP model that there is not much interaction between the public and the private players and how to strengthen the PPP model. So we have had a lot of expectations of PPPs over the last 20 years. We have been trying PPPs again and again and again. And we haven't done very well. But let's make a correction on that. Certain PPPs, the more ancillary the nature of the service, the better it performs. So in some sense, it is laundry service, dieting, security services, sanitation services, other than the fact problem that their labor is not really paid its due, we can expect a better performance. Come to ambulance services, partnerships still work. Diagnostics, not really. Clinical services, so far we have very, very poor examples of successful uh, clinical services on public-private partnership. Part of the problem is in contracting. There are some inherent problems of why public-private partnership contracts don't work because of either you get into the partner denying services or uh, if you made it pay for performance, then overusing services. So it's very difficult to strike a, a contract where you actually make it insensitive to the monetary incentive. It's, there is a problem. World over, there is a problem, but in our context, we have it more. So that's basically the problem about public road. Uh, Deepu Chandran asked about the budgetary allocation that right now it is 1.2 to 1.3 percent and it could be 6 to 8 percent if healthcare is uh, right and for not doing this is there a structural or political compulsions that that is not allowing the government to do this? I think so. I think it is basically uh, despite so much big talk about it an ideological and political driven compulsion. There are two contradictory compulsions. One, the healthcare sector is increasingly seen as an industry. Much more is managed by the Department of Industrial Motion and Commerce, and they look at this as a high growth area. Even the last few weeks when the entire uh, shares and stocks are uh, collapsing, it is the health sector stocks that are actually doing relatively well. Even in the 2008 uh, recession, the health sector stocks did relatively well. So they look at this as uh, the compound annual, uh, um, uh, annual growth rate for healthcare industry is twice that average for the service sector, which itself is twice that of the overall uh, growth rate. So they are looking to this as some sort of a growth engine, which is very contradictory, but there it is. So therefore, at some point, lot of public sector things in the ESI, in uh, you know the public sector undertakings like the steel authority, more and more of it, the pressure is to outsource their clientele into the uh, private sector on that. So part of it is ideal. The second is your whole fiscal consolidation policies. You want to keep the budget deficit down and you don't want to keep it down by having peace with your neighbors and the lesser defense expenditure 
because your politics requires a certain height. So therefore, where you are able to cut down expenditure happens to fall on education and uh, the healthcare, which gets increasingly privatized and where investment, public investment keeps going down. So this is the whole notion of fiscal consolidation and the ideological push. And finally, neoliberalism is characterized by the fact that it brings public services into the market. That has been one of its basic characteristics. And that is also playing out on that. So it's very much ideologically driven, except that, yeah, that there's many other things on that. But basically, it's that. Yeah. The other question by Shakti John, I think you had covered it of how to strengthen the infrastructure in public uh, sector. So uh, moving on to the one of Vidyas, uh, of what are the health incubators and startup accelerators in India? We have <coughs> a whole lot of the bank loans that are going through for enterprises are really going to uh, healthcare units, healthcare establishments. Even a general practitioner clinic is being used as that. We don't find too much uh, in the clinical side. Okay, except the standard loan that is easily available. Where it is very important is in biotech. For example, when the, the COVID epidemic struck a country like Iceland or South Korea or Germany, countries that have done very well, their first thing was to go catch a private enterprise over there, give them the necessary technology and skills and ramp up by a hundred times the total number of test kits that were being provided. And the test kits, the medicines, the vaccines, the personal protective equipment, all of these should, the government should actually transfer technology, skills, support and finance, a major increase in production in these areas. I think there's immense scope to do that and it should be done now within this coming last, last uh, this month and the coming month, we need to actually multiply it a hundredfold. They won't have the skills, but you need to actually support them. This is not the period when you go into a long-term incubation. This is a quick transfer of technology with financial and this support. And the countries that have done well are precisely the countries that did this. Germany, Iceland, South Korea. They did not need to do lockdown. They actually needed to have a public-private collaboration for uh, the scaling up rapidly of the health commodities that were needed to cope with the epidemic. Uh, Leo has asked about what are the best and worst case scenario for India in dealing with the worst of this pandemic, given 70% of private health care is going belly up. I... Uh, you have to get back to life as usual. Uh, there is no way that under the lockdown, uh, we will be able to survive. And the longer the lockdown exists, the, the longer we have. The lockdown does not have the same meaning in India as it has in the Europe because you have very robust social security and most of the people are in the organized sector. Here, most are in very precarious employment. And staying at home for a middle class person is social distancing, but not in a Bombay slum. Staying at home is a reduced social distancing. And for migrant labor, huddling together in migrant camps, it is actually reduced to social distance. But a whole lot of doctors are getting infected currently who are not dealing with COVID-19. So I have a lot of friends in the private sector, general practitioners, who are coming as clearly COVID-19 cases, since they are seeing general outpatients where mild and moderate cases are walking around because we are not testing and isolating them, right? So if you are in such a situation and what has the private sector have done? It has actually closed all routine services. And except for emergency calls and very few of them, the private hospitals are not running at all. But that is extraordinarily, you can't run a system that way. You just have to open your clinic and learn to deal with the COVID-19 suspect cases based upon clinical criteria. What is called COVID-19 syndrome 
as different from a laboratory diagnosed and reopen. And that's true for everybody. Public transport has to reopen, ministry, manufacturer has to reopen. What's the best case scenario? The best case scenario is that it is going to take three months for the cases to spiral up to, uh, into an epidemic proportions again. The worst case scenario is it's going to spiral up within a week. Okay, with the social lockdown having done nothing. In both these situations, we have to turn to identifying cases and only isolating identified cases and quarantining contacts and letting the rest of life continue with, within these constraints. Whatever time we have bought, we have bought. But after this, we are not even going to be able to buy time for health sector preparedness. It's too bad. We should have done a lot of this earlier. Many countries went into production of test kits after they had their first case in the country. And they managed to increase the production into the required levels. We are just about starting, but we can't go on with this. We need to open up and business as usual and take it within that structure. There is no other way we can manage it. Uh, Soumya Data asked about the refusal of the government to, for testing for COVID-19. Is it targeting uh, towards a herd immunity without telling? Yes. <laughs> I mean, to put it precisely, yes. But remember that herd immunity is not a strategy. It's a fact. It's some, not something you make happen. It happens despite you. Right? So when you say they are, this is their strategy, no, this is the result of their lack of strategy. So what is happening is herd immunity, but we don't even know who is immune. But perhaps by this whole shift to antibody testing, which is a testing of immunity that has developed rather than current infection, is perhaps signifying that they're going to use that more actively. But they won't be able to get away with it because, you know, Herd immunity means it will strike in at only 60 to 80% of the population getting infected. We are then talking of uh, something like, uh, uh, how much it is, 60 crore people are getting infected. That's just far too high a number. That means we'll be living with the epidemic for 18 months. I don't think we can afford that. The numbers of deaths will still be too high. So. Herd immunity is happening, beginning to happen, but to happen to an adequate level, it will take much longer time. And therefore, the earlier we recognize that we have really no alternative to identifying, isolating, testing and treating, we are going to be uh, in difficult times. We are going to have, from time to time, a huge outbreak and then shutting down. Uh, the other one is by Balasubramaniam, which you had uh, um, answered earlier. And uh, Prabhat is asking for, uh, is it possible to create an army of emergency health workers in the current crisis and how feasible it is? Uh, uh, one has to think of what skills they will have and what functions they will perform. And the treatment of a severe case of COVID-19 is a sophisticated tertiary care. It's not ordinary ventilation. It's a very high quality of ventilation. And the treatment of a mild and moderate case requires no treatment at all. Essentially, they, they become normal without having to actually get treated. So what is this emergency workforce about? Is there needed? It is needed. It needed if you are managing community managed isolation centers, if you open up community managed quarantine centers, if you have the community help you quarantine, uh, home quarantines, if you are helping in terms of this uh, contact tracing, in all these functions, there can be community volunteers. So, therefore, you can and you must build them up. But I am afraid that we have been going the wrong way. We have been stigmatizing too heavily, victim blaming too heavily. So instead of community solidarity, we are having uh, 
a deep uh, degree of uh, suspicion and hostility towards those who are affected or those from whom others have got the disease. That at those terms, this function that community volunteers can play will not happen. It's not in medical care that you need the community volunteers. It is in the social solidarity, it is in the social support that is required that you need community volunteers. And we need to align for that. And, and that includes things like running isolation centers and quarantine centers. Uh, you had answered uh, Vijay and Rajinder Ravis and Franco. So I'm moving to uh, Mark Makaran Purohit who's asking, uh, does the surge in different healthcare insurance schemes in the States could ever help the healthcare system in better management and delivery of health services to the poor? I wish it could. I wish I could say yes. But the data doesn't seem to show either uh, significant uh, cost reductions, uh, reductions in catastrophic health expenditure, or uh, even increase. Not as yet. And in COVID-19 and in all these disaster situations, they are really out of it. They have announced that COVID-19 is part of the package. But if the hospitals are not providing that care and have shut down rather than provide that care, then the fact that it is there announced as part of the insurance package is perfectly meaningless. So I, I don't think that we are the insurance has too much relevance on this. It may play some marginal role uh, over time. It may pick up. It may be able to expand the care. At this point of time, for the pandemic, it has very little. And even in the long run, the jury is out. We don't know whether it is. I think much better to think of things like health and wellness centers, where an expanded range of services are provided, and to see how we can incorporate more private providers into such a scheme. Uh, Jyotsna's question also, I think you had answered. Uh, so I'm moving to Anurag's uh, question of uh, TB. Like he has asked if uh, we had had TB outreach programs for a long time and yet why are we still having uh, people getting affected by TB every year? Before you answer, I would just like to mention that we would extend the session a little bit because we still have a lot of questions. But from this moment, we don't, we'll, we are not going to take any further questions. So kindly uh, do refrain from writing more questions now. Those yeah. that are already come, we'll answer. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm thankful for your help. Otherwise, I have got totally confused with so many questions uh, uh, floating around. Yeah, it's interesting. Tuberculosis is a respiratory pathogen. It is also contagious. It has also an R factor. Potentially, if you do a lockdown on TB, uh, it should also work. No, TB should reduce, but it doesn't do that. And we know that partly because it, it, the longer the prevalence of the, the, the infectivity of a patient, the longer the period of infectivity, the lesser, the more it's uh, infection and more the acute measures won't work. But to come to your key point, there are two or three major reasons. One is the social determinants of the disease. A lot of people get infected with TB, but few people get overt disease. And those who get overt disease are in some way immunocompromised or at risk by malnutrition or other respiratory disease or other factors like diabetes, HIV. That's very similar to COVID-19, is it not? And what you really have on those people is therefore they are much more vulnerable for the same degree of infection. The other thing is actually that you need a very prolonged period of care and treatment. And now that multidrug treatment has uh, achieved, you still need a lot of support on that. And some of the people who are getting treated are some of the poorest people on that. So sustained primary care with outreach and support, the entire works is needed to be able to manage it. And we are being very poor at helping the more marginalized, poorer sections of the community where TB is rampant. There the health sector outreach is also very difficult. So it's, it's as much the social determinant 
issue as a failure of primary care, both of which, which is actually reason why TB continues to be a major thing. In a given year, something like this last year, something like 2.5 lakhs, and that's a minimum, would have died of tuberculosis, far more than we have our minimal projections for coronavirus. So it's a major trend. Nagraj had asked about if the anxiety of COVID now is going to strengthen the health system, but that, that is where you started the entire session with. The second part of the question of what can activists do to push for helping strengthening public sector, if you can answer that. Uh, I think there are a number of areas where we need to do, and one of the important things is to get political accountability on this. We are getting some results by persuading people to put it on their election manifestos and then in the next election holding them accountable to. So how do we build the political accountability is one of the big issues that we need to. We talk of the accountability of everybody else. But political accountability on healthcare is something that we have not been able to push as an approach, though there is a scope to push that nowadays. There is much greater scope. I think we need to do this much more actively. I also think that at the local self-government level, there is a lot that communities can do to actually ensure that whatever healthcare is there is universalized, marginalized sections are not left out, and actively facilitate rather than just monitoring. The act of facilitation will become act of monitoring a uh, level of healthcare delivery on that. So both in advocacy and in action, there is a lot that can be done within that. You must look at the experience of the people's health movements and what they have been able to do to change the discourse around health and health rights. Women's rights, gender justice and health, the issues of access to technologies. So in each of these areas, the health movement has been able to intervene in the discourse. So it is a very strong area of advocacy and reaching out to local self bodies, uh, local uh, bodies of self-governance to strengthen their role, which can be in all municipalities. These are areas where civil society can actually play an effective role. In the delivery of healthcare, if you have a dedicated group of people, a big difference can be made. And that provides a learning and a counterpoint from the government example. So therefore, that would be a great. But that's not an easy trick to pull. It's not something that I can advise and many people can take. There has to be somebody from the other side who is very motivated and would rather do that than anything else because it's a very difficult game. Uh, healthcare, what you can charge the poor will never pay itself. So to be able to get the financing to run a community-based service is a very different type of skills and they are not the best people to work with the poor also. Very few people get that right. Uh, Abhijit had asked about what are the problems with implementation and why uh, it. So, but if I think you had covered it a bit earlier. Partly, but partly what the problem is, what do you have to. I mean, I, I, I can suggest a way for you to think about it because the uh, problem of implementation is everything. You can say, oh, they should do it. We should enforce it. It should be stronger monitoring. I would call that the enforcement route to improving implementation. You can think of the market-based routes where you are saying, make it look more like the private sector and market forces will act. And I'm saying that doesn't work also. So at some point we were talking of uh, improving accountability by having more participatory governance, more community engagement. And the third thing that I didn't emphasize is a much larger innovation. So you face an implementation barrier and then you need to catch whoever is not implementation and enforce it and enforce the change. But if 70, 80, in the first case, it's an accountability issue. Everybody is doing their job, but these two guys are not. So make them accountable. But if some program, 80% of people, 70% of people are not doing their job, 
then there is a design problem. Then there are out objective barriers. You can't attribute it just to a poor implementer. So it's more than an implementation problem. And then you will need creative, innovative design solutions to be able to overcome that problem. So somewhere it is beyond accountability. There is a need for innovation in public health service delivery, which I think the lack of it is a serious thing. And innovation should not be equated with making the markets work for public health care. Uh, Shakti has asked, uh, asked if, it is a, if there is a deliberate attempt to portray the less importance of ISM and Ayush. Deliberate on whose part? On the medical professional, uh, the modern medical part, perhaps yes, but that's not their area of skill. And they would promote what their part is. On ISMs and uh, Ayush, uh, there is a lot of people who still contribute to it. But in policy, at some point, there is this whole thing of this outcome-based thing and that accountability on that. So other than making those services available, you can't actually use these in some of the situations which we are talking of. So broad health promotion is all right. But suppose we introduce something for COVID-19 and we have very little evidence to support it the system would be held accountable. And unless there is evidence that supports its implementation, it can't. So we must differentiate between making it available and uh, being able to promote it into areas beyond where the evidence supports it. Uh, the next by uh, Balasubramaniam and Shibin, I think you can answer together. Bala Subramaniam asked, uh, like when you have uh, pointed about the localization of resources, introduction of NEET and abolition of service quota, uh, which actually in in intense incentivizes doctors to work in rural areas. So with these changes, like there is a more uh, city centric shift. And Shibin uh, has also asked about what are what could be the in in incentives to encourage uh, healthcare workers to work in underserved areas. So if you could take both of this together. Thank you. And it's a good one. I'm not a great supporter of NEET. In fact, I am very critical of it. I really think that the states should be allowed much greater autonomy in setting their thing. You can build some standards if you want. That selection is done in a fair process and it's transparent. But you can't go into deciding what that process is, much less setting the question paper and correcting the answers, etc. I think it is important that we have, even within such a situation, priority given to local candidates, especially from under-processed, uh, underprivileged communities for serving in underprivileged areas. World over, nothing works as well as that. So there are remote areas where nobody wants to go, but there are people who live there and want to live there. That's why you want to take healthcare there. Make some of them access the medical skills and that will help. So most of the uh, solutions lie along that particular axis and need actually takes you away from that. Uh, it, uh, it is objective, but nothing else. And its objectivity means only that it does not allow deliberate partiality, but it, in a systemic way, it does not select the people who are most appropriate for the job. So I think that we need to move away from that and look at other systems of uh, recruitment which are much more preference to locality-based selection, uh, training close to the community, incentive packages for those who want to work there, and a positive practice environment where the community is close to them and where there is encouragement and space for professional development. I think these are the key areas about keeping your workforce where you need them and keeping them happy. Uh, Zia has asked how funders and donor agencies can systematically respond to COVID crisis. Um, one of the areas where funders can help, and yet I'm afraid they may not help, is in the rapid transfer of technologies for scaling up production of the mass health commodities that we are requiring so urgently. 
every state should be able to manufacture the personal protective equipment that it needs. There are components of import components, there are components that require technology, blueprints need to be required, training. So a whole lot of your garment units and other units can be scaled up. I think development partners, get the South Koreans, get a team from South Korea, never mind your per, uh, national pride, etc. Get the team of South Koreans to come and help uh, Tirupur uh, or uh, Jalandhar to start up immediately the production of personal uh, protective equipment. Do the same for testing kits. Have some 15 centers ramp up production to close to 10,000, 20,000 per day. Uh, UK plans to test 1 lakh per day. We should be doing something like 1 million per day at the peak of a thing. But even if we are able to reach, today we are what? At about 3,000 per day. Only yesterday we reached that figure. Otherwise we were a few hundred per day. And we can actually go up if we can... So I would focus on ramp. And the third is the ventilators and pulse oximeters and oxygen supplies and oxygen concentrators. So a whole range of what we call essential health commodities that are needed to tackle the crisis. We need transfers of technology, handholding to be able to ramp up manufacture. And in our situation of joblessness and industrial collapse, this would be a great, great boon. I think this is extremely important that we do that. And we will need to do that once the vaccines and the medicines come along. The medicines should be available within three to four months and the vaccines within a year. And we will need to ramp up the production of these also on very great scale. So again, the donor partners have a major role to do that. The, uh, I don't think they have too much of a role in terms of this. If there is any financing that they can do for it, it's useful. But uh, I don't think they would be able to help even in surveillance because of the fact that you need the state governments involved. And at some point, there's far too much active data suppression at this point of time to build an information system. This is not the time you build an information system. We had a very good flu surveillance system which was reporting flu-like illnesses. But instead of scaling it up at this point of time, they start, stopped putting the data on the public domain from February 23rd. So, in fact, you know, the transparency of systems, otherwise they could have helped, but there's no space. So, I think overall health sector preparedness, strengthening systems, they can help. But at this point of time, the focus should be on maximizing health commodities. Uh, the other question by Junaid, I think you have already answered uh, whether there will be a shift towards public health and uh, health in India right now. So going to Franco's, like how is the testing for COVID right now? We are highly constrained. So much to say that this is testing is now becoming quite a bit of a scandal. Uh, there are two reasons why it's a scandal. We keep comparing our figures with the international figures. International figures are testing for mild and moderate cases in most countries, at least trying to. In countries like Iceland, they are by design testing for asymptomatic people, even if not carriers, even if not contacts. Now we can't compare our figures, which are testing only severe cases, or contacts of known COVID-19 who are also symptomatic, we are only restricting testing so much that we are not able to detect community transmission at all because of this. To add insult to injury, the ICMR test guidelines for severe cases wants you to test for severe people with influenza-like illness who are admitted and who have pneumonia only in 50% as a sort of sampling technique. But the other 50% would be infecting people and we would are, therefore would be dying. And at some point, you are actually uh, not testing all. There are some more clauses put there. I'm not going into. So even on severe cases by design, by protocol, we are not testing many people. As a result, we are flying blind. When we lift the lockdown, we are not going to have eliminated the cases, which is to some extent all right. We don't expect to have eliminated it. But we don't, won't know where the hotspots are. 
and what we know of hotspots tends to be carried away with the prejudices we have. So we have tracked down one super spreader in the mosque incident and we followed all of it and made so much of a noise and feeling very, very happy with ourselves for doing that. When actually there may be 10 more like this and we are seeing cases which you're completely missing because at some point your testing design does not allow you to test and it is so selective in your testing. So I think the major scaling up and del allowing anybody with COVID-like symptoms to be tested is utterly central to being able to fight this epidemic. And you have it coming from all international and expert sources. But our message over here is it is only social distancing that can save you. No. Social distancing has a limited effect. It is not a very powerful tool. But it is, okay, the one tool that we can implement by ourselves. But the larger issue is in testing and isolation. Uh, and Dr. Ashwini Jadav ha has asked, what should be the public uh, health system's response to homeless people, nomadic communities in a pandemic kind of situation? So one of the things that you, you need to do is to actually bring them into shelters and be able to convert temporary shelters for that purpose. The government did that, but were embarrassed to find that the total number of homeless increased dramatically, which you have to live with. And some of them were not homeless, but became homeless because of the lockdown. And you have to be able to provide both the food and the quarantining that is going to be required. And keep removing the people who develop symptoms from that and put them into isolation. So that you have a constant ability to monitor this. And we will need to do that in scale. Otherwise, all our social distancing and lockdown is not really going to work if you have a number of such people around. You know, it's all right to say a Lakshman Rekha, draw a Lakshman Rekha around your door. But if you don't have a door, how do you have a Lakshman Rekha? And Swati has asked about the nurses suffering due to mismanagement and what are your recommendations towards a solution? I think somewhere the, the scaling up of personal protective equipment is important. There is another important criteria. You can't have too much working hours. It is also, this infection is also sensitive to the viral load you take on. The longer working hours will give you longer things. So giving them frequent breaks from, inter, from their work and also uh, reducing the number of working hours per day are both necessary means to be able to secure them along with PPE. So it is PPE rotating them for people who are on the interface so that you reduce the amount of days they are on the interface and reduce the amount of numbers per day. Remember, a good system which plans for nursing keeps almost 20 to 25 percent additional nurses to deal with leave reserves. Nursing necessarily has larger number of women going on leave, partly because they have greater child care and home care responsibilities, but partly because not only due to COVID-19, they are, as a group, always more susceptible to nosocomial, that is, hospital-acquired infections. And you need that extra reserve army of nurses so that you are able to keep the nursing uh, positions fully occupied on that. And I think that we are going to require in nursing that approach even now. Bhagwan Kishbat had asked about how our friend activists and networks can help the situation, which I think you have covered already. So going to Preeta KV's question on uh, adequate attention on disease, are we doing adequate, at giving adequate attention on disease preventing and health promotion overall? And how can public health system in India, how, how are they faring on this aspect? So, in some sense, we must remember disease prevention has been the function of our primary care system, our sub-centers and our PHCs. 
when it comes to care in pregnancy immunization they've been doing a good job though i'm afraid covid-19 is disrupting immunization schedules in an unforgivable way we may have people dying out of children dying out of measles instead of senior citizens dying from covid-19 that's not a good trade off but having said that we as a system has been good at these elements of uh, these elements of uh, preventive care but when it comes to non communicable disease when it comes to other mental illness we've been rather poor the second part where we've been poor is much of preventive care in health is not what the health department does but what other departments do so air pollution road traffic management uh transport systems the nature of urbanization all of these are not really under the health department but they have a great meaning in preventive health care so this is generally the requirements to be multi sectoral in action is one of the key issues where i think we still remain very very below the required levels of effective sorry neeraj has given a link and uh, others okay neeraj is also asking about the market forces enforcement etc and uh, handling patients with more compassion like i think so and one would have expected that covid 19 would have improved it but actually one is surprised the hostility with which uh, patients are being treated and you are having uh, community treating doctors badly you are having violence by community against doctors for having been treated badly at some point uh, a mutual sense of fear and distancing has developed and i think we need to really really work on the social solidarity area on that so it is an issue that at some point you need much greater empathy between the provider and provided and for that you need to get away from victim blaming stigmatization say you know filing firs against people who have spread the disease as if some willing action to commit murder they have done that you file fir that approach is leading people to hide from being detected to uh, pre prevent them from cooperating in tracing contacts they are not going to let out names of people who they think will get harassed subsequently by the police if you are your loved one you are not going to give out the name however serious to the police person to come and harass my daughter i am not going to do that so the, given the whole way in which we have gone victim blaming we gone the wrong way on this i don't know what leadership it will take to reverse this uh sense but we need to do it fast uh yogada joshi asks your view on moral hazard in the context of insurance uh, that's that's a different question the different question that's a provider induced moral hazard that i think that the notion of moral hazard is that when a person with an insurance cover comes to a private provider the 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 patient feels that look i am already covered for 10 lakhs or 5 lakhs or 2 lakhs so why shouldn't i consume more care why shouldn't i take that extra ct scan which i don't need why don't i get that blood test done he feels morally justified in taking so he, he doesn't feel wrong about it the doctor also feels that i can order that ct scan my reimbursement will be more i wouldn't have ordered it otherwise but the patient is covered by insurance so let me do that let me give him that extra medicine let me give him that unnecessary diagnostic it will give money to the uh, hospital but the patient is not paying for it and sometimes even the insurance company and third party uh, insurers are paid based on turnover and they also feel happy for it 
So then everybody seems happy and seems morally justified. So why are then why is the system unhappy about it? Becomes the question. And that's a classical moral hazard of overconsumption because the incentives are aligned that way. And that leads to excessive uh, use of uh, healthcare, which also means it deprives necessary healthcare where it is needed, becomes a supplier induced market instead of responding to real healthcare needs. So it's a danger, but at that individual level, it's not a danger. It's seen as something welcome, but actually it is a danger. Uh, Sriniti has asked uh, if India is producing kits right now, and if not, what is restricting it? So this is the paradox on this. Only on May, March 24th, I think they announced the lockdown. On March 23rd afternoon, 4 o'clock, they sanctioned the first three kit manufacturers for India. That late. Iceland and South Korea, when they heard there was an epidemic in Wuhan, and they did not yet have a single death, they started manufacturing the kit. But we, some of them were even exporting kits. The only people who were, were importing kits from the U.S., and even now, many of the people sanctioned are actually importing kits from the U.S. and Germany. Now, when the, with the epidemic taking these proportions in USA and in Germany, those people have stopped exporting kits to us. They have closed the exports there. And therefore, the people we assured on March 23rd had to go into production so it will take one or two weeks for them to start producing. And after that, the whole stocking distribution validation, there's a big job ahead. Now they have, uh, they have uh, I think, made 11 or 17 more. Uh, uh, I think this next week after that, they have sanctioned. But many of them are importers again. So it's not sure whether they have any manufacturing capacity whatsoever. So I think we are... So what were we doing before? Institutes like National Institute of Virology made a few homemade kits, so to speak, in their own laboratories, which is something that works for small scale, but was totally unsuited to scaling up. So I think that is the big issue. The answer is right now we have still, I think about one of them have gone into production, but not really, perhaps none of them have gone into production. But some, anywhere between 7 to 11, have been sanctioned the production. Okay, I think we have come to the close of the session. And uh, yeah, many of you have also asked if there is recording. Yes, it is being recorded and it is available and will be sent to all those who have registered. And it is also put up. Uh, in our website, senfa.org. And uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Sundar Raman, and thank you for those who asked the questions. And please do join the series. We are doing it till the 17th, uh, mostly 11 a.m. to 12 <clears throat> noon. So hopefully, I'll see most of you tomorrow also. Thank you all. Thank Have you. a good day. Thanks.